Hello, I'm Daniel. I'm a meditation teacher in Kansas City, and this is my podcast, Sharpening the Mind. The teachings in this podcast are free of charge, but of course, if you feel compelled to make a donation, you can do so by clicking the link in the show notes. Hello, I'm Daniel. The title of this talk is Training in Compassion. Training in Compassion. And I will start with a quote. This is a quote by Christina Feldman in her book, Boundless Heart. Okay? She says, and I quote, Compassion has the power to bring harshness and cruelty to an end. Compassion heals our hearts even when pain cannot be fixed. Compassion is the root of forgiveness, patience, and tolerance. The seed of profound and immeasurable compassion lies in each of our hearts. And again, that was from Christina Feldman in her book, Boundless Heart, which is a book I've really been enjoying lately. <clears throat> so, compassion is, I think, fundamental to living an ethical and fulfilled life. Fundamental. The original term that we're translating as compassion is karuna. Karuna. K-A-R-U-N-A. And it's an attitude that we can cultivate in our lives. Compassion is the wish for others and ourselves to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. That's it. We have a habit sometimes of ignoring suffering or trying to ignore it. This can apply to our suffering or the suffering of another person. I think I can't stress that enough. Compassion for ourselves is important too. It's just easier for us to pretend suffering isn't there, to look away when there's something wrong, you know? Training in compassion really challenges us to stop pretending, to turn toward the suffering and see what we can do, if anything, to help, to relieve it. In her book, Boundless Heart, Christina Feldman goes on to say, At the heart of compassion is the invitation to turn toward suffering. Just as the longing for love, safety, and respect is a universal longing and story, so too is pain a universal and inescapable story. In the anguished moments of loneliness, grief, and fear that can touch our lives, we are convinced that no one else has ever felt this way before. Yet there may be a moment when we find the courage to open our eyes and hearts and see that same pain mirrored in the eyes and lives of everyone around us. Compassion connects us with other people. That uh, End quote, sorry. Compassion connects us with other people. It brings us together as few other things in this world can. It's where we get the reminder that other people are people too. As they say, everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. I don't know what that comes from, but that's a, that's a quote that I see sometimes. And I think that's true. We are all enduring the suffering of old age, sickness, and death. We are all enduring the suffering of not getting what we want and seeing people we care about in distress. We have this in common with everyone. No one on this planet doesn't suffer. We can also get caught up in our stuff, so caught up that we forget this. We forget that other people are people. We may not like think directly like that's not a person, but at some level we forget that people have the same needs, fears, desires that we have. Everyone you meet also has had their opinions shaped by their environments. That's a really important point because we still get mad at people for not thinking like we do. And we don't give any grace to respect the fact for even a second that their experience has been very different than ours. And that has led other people to have opinions that might confuse or shock us. They have a different experience, so we can have a little bit of grace for that, I think, even when we disagree. We're all suffering. Uh, by the way, something about that word suffering, I don't really like it that much. We're talking about the word dukkha. Dukkha is the original term, and it's been translated as suffering for a very long time now. It was the an idea someone had to translate that as suffering, and everyone has stuck with it. And I think that word might miss the mark a little because it's, it seems like a bit much to me. Dukkha 
is, in the original terminology, described as like having an ox cart with a messed up or broken wheel. And in this time and place, we don't, we don't think about ox carts very much. I'm not 100% sure what an ox cart is. I'm picturing um, Oregon Trail is what I'm picturing because I'm of a certain generation. But for the sake of simplicity, let's pretend it means a shopping cart with a messed up wheel. So sometimes you go to the grocery store and you get a shopping cart. And you're doing your shopping and you notice after a few minutes that one of the wheels is a little bit messed up. Say every few minutes it gets stuck for a second or it rattles or it makes a terrible squeaking sound or something like that. Bad enough to be irritating, but most of the time a cart is not so broken that we would trade it in for another cart. Usually we don't do that at the store, even though we all have that experience of getting a cart that doesn't really work like it's supposed to. It just makes our shopping experience just a little bit more unpleasant. It doesn't necessarily totally ruin it, but it makes it a little more unpleasant. Our life, our life is like a shopping cart. Sometimes the wheels don't work the way we want them to. Sometimes one wheel's a little bit messed up. Sometimes several wheels are a little bit messed up, right? And sometimes it really feels like this cart is not going to move. Are you following? So when we say life is suffering, we're really saying life is like pushing a shopping cart with a broken wheel. That's how I think of it. When I think of the word suffering, I think of something a lot more severe than what I'm facing most of the time. You know, when I think of suffering, I think of um, really horrible things happening. Really horrible things happening. So I like to just use the word dukkha if I can. But that, you know, dukkha is not a great sounding word either. But suffering is a bit overselling in my mind. Most of the time, but not all the time, right? Sometimes we definitely go through, every human being goes through what I would call horrible suffering at some point in their lives. No one has such a charmed life that they don't go through something horrible. I believe that. So, dukkha is said to have several aspects, and I think it's meaningful to think about those. They are, there are three of these. They are the pain of pain. That's number one. Number two is impermanence and change. And number three is what I call the second arrow. And sometimes it's called the second dart. I believe in Christina Feldman's book, she calls it the second dart. I've usually called it the second arrow in my own writings and talks. But second dart is just as good. It's the same concept. So I'm going to talk about each of these. So the pain of pain. Pain is unavoidable. We can try to numb ourselves to avoid it, but that doesn't really work. You can't selectively numb emotions. You can't selectively numb emotions. So if you work really hard to stop feeling pain, the negative emotions, you're probably going to not experience as much joy either. That's why vulnerability is so important. That's why wholehearted living is so important. But anyway, you can't really avoid pain. The Rolling Stones were right when they said you can't always get what you want. There will always be things in your life that you would like to get rid of. Pretending the pain isn't there, hiding from it, burying it doesn't help very much. Uh, Feldman goes on to say, we learn we can turn toward rather than away from, to include rather than to exclude, to attend rather than to ignore, and to open our hearts to the cries of our own hearts and to the cries of the world. End quote. So the second aspect, impermanence and change. Impermanence and change. Things come into our lives and go. And sometimes we desperately want things to stay the same, but they don't. Things come together and things fall apart. And I think the older we get, the more we get reminders that we're impermanent too, right? My Nothing I can do is as fast as it used to be. Because I'm in my 40s now, right? Impermanence is scary. And we get as we get older, we start to get constant reminders of it. But it's also what's behind positive changes. Because of impermanence, things can get better. Change can bring us hope instead of sorrow, you know? 
when something really bad happens, we can remind ourselves, well, this is going to pass. And we can do the same when something really good happens. We can remind ourselves this is going to pass. And that way we don't cling too tightly in either direction because actually clinging tightly in either direction can lead us to trouble. So the third one is the second arrow. Um, This might be my favorite one to think about and talk about. Sometimes we get so caught up in our own suffering that we actually make it worse. And we can call that the second arrow or the second dart. Why would we call it that? There's a story the Buddha told about a man who was hit by an arrow. And after he was hit, people came to help take care of him and, you know, get the arrow out and clean the wound or whatever. But he wouldn't let them. He was obsessed and ruminating instead. He asked where the arrow came from, how it was made, who shot it, why someone would shoot it, all kinds of questions instead of dealing with the problem, which is there's an arrow in his body, right? He was in a state of mind we can all be familiar with, so he was just not letting these people help him. He was thinking in a state of mind that we can all be familiar with. He was thinking, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? And I want to suggest that we can think something else instead. We can think instead of why is this happening to me? We can think right now it's like this. What can I do? Right now it's like this. What can I do? Right? Get that arrow out. Get help cleaning that wound. Go rest. Whatever. Right? Instead of just sitting there obsessing. That's a much more helpful way of thinking. It's a much more helpful way of thinking because too often we got caught up in what's happening and we're making our own pain much worse than it is. Much worse. So those are the aspects of dukkha. All of these are experienced by all people. And the way out is acceptance. It's just cultivating that what can I do mind. And I have to say, the first two aspects are inevitable. There is pain in life and things are impermanent. There's nothing we can do to completely get rid of those. And actually, we can make ourselves quite upset thinking we can get rid of those. But that third one is a different story. We have some control of that second arrow. I'll tell you a quick story about to elucidate the second arrow. This one time, I noticed my my tire on my car had a slow leak. It was slowly getting flatter and flatter. Now, this made me immediately worry and start to panic. I was on my way to this store called Discount Tire to see what my options were. And while I was on the way, I got that second arrow. The first arrow was the incredible inconvenience of the tire getting flat. The second arrow was the stories I started telling myself. I started thinking I'd have to get a new tire and that tire would be expensive. And I wondered if the store would have the tire that I needed or if they'd have to order it. And I wondered if this would take a long time and I would miss multiple days of work. And I wondered how the kids would get to school without me having a car, right? And all this story I was telling myself on the way to the tire store was really stressing me out. And I'll tell you what happened. I got there and within half an hour, they had patched my tire and sent me on my way. So I was telling myself all these things that would happen and I was really making things worse for myself. I made myself more upset than I needed to be, and that is the second arrow. It would have been much better for me if I had just thought, right now it's like this. I've got a leak in my tire. What can I do? Right now it's like this. What can I do? I could make the case that I was not being compassionate to myself by letting myself exacerbate my own suffering. But more importantly, I think it helps us to remind ourselves that everyone suffers from these aspects of dukkha. We are all suffering. In some ways, our suffering is in our control, and in others, it is not. And this is the case for every person on this planet. But also, we do have the power to decide how we're going to respond to it. We have the power. And it went in that on that day, I could have responded more skillfully and I could have had that state of mind of what can I do and just tried to solve the problem instead of going into this narrative about how awful it was and how big of a problem it was right we can be with our pain and try to accept it we can be with impermanence and try to accept it and we can learn to avoid the second arrow 
or at least avoid it more than we're doing now. And that's a big part of self-compassion, I think. I like being able to pause and take a moment and just ask myself, am I telling a story right now? And another thing we can do is show people some grace. Because we know they've struggled with these things and we struggle with them too. And some grace is a good thing to show people. Sometimes we may be tempted to think we don't deserve compassion or to think others don't deserve compassion because somebody's such an awful person. And I think we need to be kind because everyone is fighting a hard battle. Everyone. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me and have a good day. Thank you for listening and have a good day.